Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's uh, seminar, which is being co-hosted by the Department of Epidemiology and the Clinical Research Facility, Cork. Um, we're delighted to welcome Professor Neil Poulter, who's here today in his capacity as external examiner for Anne Marie O'Flynn. So we'd like to say congratulations to her on passing her viva. So Professor Neil Poulter is the Professor of Preventative Cardiovascular Medicine in the Imperial College of London and is also co-director of the International Centre for Circulatory Health and Imperial Clinical Trials Unit. So today he's going to talk to us about cardiovascular outcomes trial in type 2 diabetes. So hopefully we'll have um, time for comments and questions at the end. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon everybody. I just like to say I'm delighted to come to Cork. The last time I was here to see my daughter at least I flew in here. She was cooking at Ballymaloo, I think. If any of your children say, please, can I go on a course to Ballymaloo? <laughs> Unless you're very rich, say no. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it's great to be here. And it was particularly enjoyable this morning. Uh, well done. Right. Um, I'm going to belt round in a particularly typically shambolic way, my thoughts on the cardiovascular outcomes trial in type 2 diabetes because I think it's very exciting. It's, the, the things have changed dramatically. There's lots of exciting stuff. And because I think it is the biggest threat to cardiovascular disease and therefore global mortality at the moment, I think diabetes is a terribly important subject. So this slide lists uh, 19 risk factors and their impact on um, all cause mortality relatively recently and what you see is high blood pressure is in pole position and that doesn't matter whether you're in fr from a high income, middle income or low income, it's the biggest single contributor to death. It's a bit of a cheat because that takes systolic at 115 and above but nevertheless it's a huge contributor. Um, there you see high glucose and there you see physical inactivity. So really that's the combination of blood pressure and diabetes. High glucose and physical inactivity really equals diabetes. Along with high blood pressure, you've got this uh, collection of risk factors that really need dealing with. So let's deal with blood pressure lowering first of all in the context of type 2 diabetes. And the first question is, well, I'm not going to talk about diet and lifestyle because you're quite good at that here. Um, and uh, I know that's something you all specialise in and I won't say any more about it, except it's clear that has to be a pivotal role. And it'll be in my summary slide at the end that dealing with that is critical, but um, we need to think about the drugs. And this was one of the earliest studies, perhaps the most famous diabetes study ever, UK PDS. And in dark blue, you see the impacts of tight glucose control and in light blue, tight blood pressure control. And it wasn't very tight either. But, and that was the best you could do at the time. This was, wasn't very tight, we can do a lot better. Here you see the impact on stroke, any diabetes, and diabetic death, and microvascular complications. Only for microvascular complications hitherto has glucose lowering been anything like as good as tight blood pressure lowering. So one of the things that UK PDS did tell us was treat the blood pressure, get it down. Um, first lesson then was treat the blood pressure, get that down, it's critical. But which drug to use, there was a beta blocker versus an ACE inhibitor, but it had no power to compare these two drug classes. And for a while, diabetologists were confused and went around saying that beta blockers were as good as ACE inhibitors because of the data here, which had no power to evaluate that question. So we don't know what the right drugs, certainly on UK PDS, should be for type 2 diabetes. Now this is what um, NICE in UK have recommended as their guidance for treating blood pressure in general without specific indications. Um, under the age of 55 you start with an A drug, that's an ACE or an ARB. So if you're 55 and above or black of African origin, use a C drug, calcium channel blocker. And the rationale for that, if you're interested in the physiology, it's really that when you're younger like that, you've got high renin levels, these drugs work best on renin, they bring the blood pressure down best in that setting. Whereas here, older people and people of black of African origin, calcium channel blockers, they tend to have low renin levels and that's where calcium channel blockers do better. So this simple algorithm was, in terms of blood pressure reduction, start with an A 
Uh, if you're older or black, start with a C, then put them together, then add in a diuretic, etc. Um, and the, D, the diuretic is do not use thiazides. That was a bit of a bombshell. Do not use thiazides. The commonest used agent in the world, the commonest diuretic used, don't use them. And I, could, I don't know if I've got it, I don't think I have. There is no trial evidence for low-dose thiazides in morbidity mortality trials. There is evidence for other drugs, and that's what we should use. That's the recommendation. But the point about this is that this algorithm, for many diabetologists, they take it that you should start there with an A drug. ACE or ARB is the belief. And I don't think that's true. I think in type 2 diabetes, we should start with a drug that's going to lower the blood pressure best. And that for most of them, because most of them are over 55, is to start with a calcium channel blocker. Uh, diabetologists don't like that, I'll show you why, but they don't. And I think that's probably where you should start, if you're in that category, and then you add the two together, and then you go to A plus C plus D. And so the algorithm I don't think should change for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, however, if we go back 12 years or so, the British Hypertension Society came up with a relatively reasonable statement. I think some of this will change. Almost all patients with hypertension and diabetes will require a combination of blood pressure lowering drugs. You're almost certainly going to need two or more drugs. And the evidence for RAS blockade, that's an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, for nephroprotection and reduction in surrogates, and that's what it is, proteinuria and CV protection, strongly support the use of an ACE or an ARB as part of the treatment cocktail, especially those at higher cardiovascular risk. So it says the same thing. You're almost certainly going to need an A drug at some point. But now a few things that have thrown us off the scent. I don't know, you may or may not remember this ABCD trial. This is where patients were randomized to receive a calcium channel blocker or an ACE inhibitor. They were all diabetic. And that the, the diabetic patients were subdivided into normotensive and hypertensive. And it was ACE versus, and the trial was stopped early because in the hypertensive subgroup amongst the diabetics, there was a problem and that looked as though the calcium channel blocker was associated with much more coronary, more, more coronary events. But sometime after the trial was stopped, this appeared in the New England Journal. During the remaining year of the study, a private detective identified six additional documented non-fatal MIs. And at the time, a private detective? What was going on? That was I mean, now I think you accept running clinical trials that you do employ private detectives regularly to find people. It's not ethical not to do so. I mean, they're not the sort with their collars turned up <laughs> hanging around. These are people who are just privately detecting the internet, etc. Anyway, um, that, was, that was what happened. And this was the impact. Um, this was before. This is why the trial in the hypertensive group was stopped because there were 25 MIs in the CCB group, five in the ACE group, relative risk of five, statistically significant, stop the trial. Panic amongst the diabetologists. What the hell are we going to do? Calcium channel blockers probably cause myocardial infarction. Oh, God. And then, the, then along came the detective, and the six new MIs, two were out of there and four were out of there, and it now became a relative risk of three, not statistically significant. And then when they added in the normotensive component of diabetics, absolutely no signal of a difference at all. Now the downside to this is, first of all, that trial was spoilt, should have been allowed to carry on. More importantly, there's been a hangover that calcium channel blockers are not good for diabetics. Not true. And that has been promulgated by this idea that calcium channel blockers are less good at dealing with proteinuria. That is true, but in terms of cardiovascular events, that doesn't matter at all. And so that you will often get the diabetological fraternity will stop calcium channel blockers and replace it with an ACE or an ARB in the interest of treating proteinuria, which is not good for the patients. So it's caused confusion, and, and in the diabetes lobby, an anti-calcium channel blocker feeling which is inappropriate. So now let's go back to this idea of which A. I showed you that there was A or C, and then A plus C. And in the NICE guidelines of 2011, it said um, you could use either an angiotensin receptor blocker or an ACE inhibitor, which is fair, 
because that's the nice guidelines are the only ones who do a proper systematic review. And when you do systematic reviews of the data, you have to make rules. And the rules include you can only give one drug preference over another if there is head-to-head -head evidence to do so. And there is one trial that compared ACEs and ARBs, and that was the on-target trial, and it sh showed overall no significant difference between the two. And without going into the details of that, I think um, that was fair insofar as in that trial, the short-acting ACE inhibitor, Remipril, was as good as a long-acting ARB. And I think that was really what the difference was. Given that, they came out overall to be the same. But out with the one trial that NICE are allowed to look at, we as clinicians, or those who are clinicians in the audience, do have the ability to look at the other trials and just make some opinion. I think it's very difficult to look at the evidence that's been coming in and draw the conclusion that the ACE inhibitors are only as good as the ARBs. I used to believe that ARBs were ACE inhibitors without a cough. They were just as good. I do not believe that now. It's very difficult to look at the roadmap trial. It's very difficult to look at the series of trials, profess, transcend, where the ARBs have systematically failed to deliver and say they're as good as ACE inhibitors. I just don't think that's likely to be true. I'm sorry we don't have time to go through the evidence with you if you wanted to get into a punch-up about it. But I'll just show you one meta-analysis for the, for the diabetes slant that we're taking. This is a meta-analysis, Cochrane Collaboration 2012, comparing ACEs and ARBs on proteinuria uh, and mortality. And here you see ACEs 29% reduction, ARBs a 10% reduction. Uh, ACE inhibitors on mortality 16% reduction, ARBs no reduction in all-cause mortality. Now, this isn't isolated. These, and I won't show you, there's, a, there's a, an updated diabetes meta-analysis showing the same thing, that the ARBs were inferior. Uh, but here's four lots of meta-analyses, one in hypertension, one in diabetes. Um, that's the one I just showed you. Coronary artery disease and high-risk patients comparing ACEs with ARBs. And this is the ben benefit for ACE. And there's ARBs. ACE, ARB, ACE, ARB, ACE, ARB. They do seem to be systematically superior. And that message, I don't think, has got through to many parts of the medical practice. So how low should we go with the blood pressure? Well, if you go back to before 2013, the world was in agreement uh, that the right thing was to go to less than 130 and until the ACCORD trial came along. And what this did was randomize <coughs> patients with type 2 diabetes to standard care getting the systolic to less than 140, or intensive care, getting it to less than 120. And they reached 119, which again, for the people who work in blood pressure clinics, you'll appreciate that's very difficult. Getting di diabetic patients to have a, diastolic, a systolic of 119 isn't easy, but they did it. About a 15 millimeter difference here, and overall there was no significant benefit of um, the intensive blood pressure lowering versus standard. Disappointing. It was about a 12% benefit, but it wasn't statistically significant. It was written up in the New England Journal as a negative trial. There was no benefit. Unless you looked at stroke. And again, this is cherry picking. Nothing went in the wrong direction. Nothing went in the wrong direction. And stroke was 42% reduction in those who were in the intensive group. Statistically significant. And I put it to you, if you were diabetic and somebody came at you and said, I can actually reduce your stroke by 40%. Would you like it? Well, I think I would. So I think this was over-interpreted as a negative trial, but nevertheless, it impinged on guidance. And so as a result of those results, European guidance here, and two lots of American, put the targets for blood pressure in diabetes up to 140, where hitherto the world had been united at 130 over 80. 130 was absolutely fine for the world. There was zero evidence for 130 over 80, but they all agreed with each other. And really, my point when this happened was because 120 wasn't overall better than 140, why would you go back to 140? Why wouldn't you leave it at 130? 
which is they just went back to what there was never any evidence for 130 anyway leave it as it was it seemed to me to make no sense whatsoever I'm not sure if I've got the I have the Canadian guidelines which I think are a very good group they've stuck with it they've seen the same evidence as this lot and said no I think 13080 is right and there's more stuff bubbling through at the moment but I, I still think that 13080 is right for patients 139 won't do if you're diabetic in my opinion all right now for patients with diabetes what about lipid lowering well this is much more easy going back to UK PDS the predictors of coronary events the first two were levels of dyslipidemia raised LDL and lowered HDL were big predictors not that that necessarily means anything uh, and as of about what's that 22 years ago the evidence from the trials was quite clear that lipid lowering was mandatory in patients who've got established coronary disease. There was no argument. That's what you should do. There are a few areas that weren't clear. When should you start? And the miracle trial told us, say, start straight away. What about the very lowest levels of LDL? Well, heart protection study said that was, yep, that's fine. Over 60, heart protection and 4S, yep, treat them. Diabetes. That was a question because the dyslipidemia of diabetes is low HDL and high triglycerides. It isn't characterized by a raised LDL necessarily. LDL is the putative fraction, the bad bit. Um, but it's more about these raised triglycerides and low HDL. And so the question was, in that group, should we... Um, treat with a statin because the statin really hits the LDL not so much the HDL and the trigs but in fact when we look at the data the 4S trial the subgroup with type 2 diabetes this is the impact on coronary events small subgroup but nevertheless big fat benefit in the diabetic subgroup and if we look at the heart protection study here you see a 34 percent reduction in those with type 2 diabetes associated with the simvastatin so it worked in those two subgroups, so the evidence was there for statins. And then along came a trial, not a subgroup, but now a trial targeted at the diabetic population. These are people who hadn't got established vascular disease, and they were randomized to a placebo, a starting dose of a torvastatin, and they had to have little bits and bobs here, but nothing particularly clever. The only thing was there were no previous cardiovascular disease, reasonable wide age range of 40 to 75. And here you see the results. Primary endpoint had to be stopped early this trial because there was a bigger than a third reduction in the primary endpoint, which is the usual thing of uh, fatal MI, non-fatal MI, and angina, etc. Usual thing. Uh, and there were big benefits. Stroke was massive, 48%, which is probably chance. It's bigger than you'd expect, certainly. But big benefits. So here was primary prevention in type 2 diabetes. Really, I think, which... Gave you, so there's absolutely no excuse for not giving a patient with type 2 diabetes a statin. Why would you not give a patient with diabetes a statin? I don't know the answer to that. And then if you look at the trials overall, this is the cholesterol trialist collaboration. And what they've done is stratified their various endpoints, major coronaries, revascularization, stroke, major vascular events, by diabetes or not and as you can see the effects for diabetes and non-diabetes are identical they're big and they're identical in this collection of 14 trials that included type 2 diabetes and of course these are relative risk reductions for a millimole reduction in LDL and if the relative risk reduction is the same in non-diabetics as it is in diabetics because the diabetics are at more absolute risk the absolute benefit that diabetics get is bigger so really, I think it's just writ large that if you've got type 2 diabetes, you should be on a statin. But whenever any new drug comes out that lowers lipids, they wheel out this story about relative, uh, residual risk. And I think there's an RRR club, which is the residual risk something club, um, pulled together, I guess, by a drug company who was just trying to drive the idea. See, these are the percentage reductions in each of the trials of um, vascular events that were achieved in these statin trials. It's very good, really. 
But they make the point that, of course, that the other events, this larger proportion of events, remains. And they say, well, that's not very good, is it? There's clearly other things to do. You should use our drug, which will attack these other 70% of the events. But I just, my thoughts on this residual risk thing is that the reason you've got residual risk is that there are obviously many other risk factors in these patients who go into the trials other than lipids and you don't impinge on those other risk factors. You don't lower their blood pressure and you don't stop them smoking, etc., etc. Secondly, the lipid profiles within the trials don't get normalized, they just get improved on average in these statin trials. You don't normalize them. Nobody gets driven down to where it should ultimately be. They just get 10 of a torva or 40 of a torva or whatever it may be, 40 of Simba. So we're, we're not maximizing the lipid lowering that we, could, uh, we should do to get maximum cardiovascular benefit. Now the other thing is that these trials, maybe four or five years, the atheroma that you've built up, people are on average 65 years of age, they've been furring up their arteries for a good 50 years. 55 years. And so you're furring up your arteries for 55 years and you put them on a drug for five years and you expect that atheroma that you've worked on for 55 years very diligently in McDonald's and everywhere else, you've tried really hard to get your arteries furred up. And in five years you expect to get rid of it all. It's just an unreasonable expectation, I think. And then, this is what the companies who introduced the residual risk story think, maybe we should be hitting other lipid targets. Well, maybe we should. Maybe we should be lowering the triglycerides more effectively, and the type of LDL might be targeted, there are, and raising the HDL. These are all things that might be reasonable explanations for the residual risk. But, if we look at the benefits so far. The statin trials for about a millimole, you're getting about a 30% reduction in uh, risk. That's the thing I showed you before. The other things, if you actually did some reasonable blood pressure lowering, you get another 25%. If you stop people smoking, now that's very conservative. But if you say only 20% were smoking and they are halved, so you get about a 10% reduction there. If you get people to exercise, you get an extra 10%. These are estimates because we don't have good trial evidence to support that. Um, but if we add in, if we optimize the LDL reduction, get more LDL reduction with another millimole, for example, you could expect another 20%. And then you could start thinking about the other lipid targets. So what's that? 55, 65, 75, 95% of this, 95% of this is explained and dealt with just with what we know. You don't need too much of this. It may give you some icing on the cake. And the other thing is here, that now you've got the PCSK9 inhibitors. These are injectable drugs, subcutaneous, amazing drugs. If their LDL reduction translates into cardiovascular event reduction, that 20 will go up to 55%. So you can save then about 145% of the events, which is really clever. So I think there's huge potential in what we've got, I suppose is my point. To come to the guidelines, well, they've said secondary prevention, everyone says you want intensive statin therapy. But type 2 diabetes, in primary prevention, the world is pretty much agreed they should be on a tall statin 20. That's good LDL reduction, they're generic, and they work, and they've got lots of trial evidence to support their use. Uh, interestingly, that we've now gone for the use of non-HDL cholesterol, which for those in the audience who aren't into lipids, this is the total minus the HDL. In your total cholesterol, you have the good bit, which is HDL cholesterol. The rest you don't want. Well, you, you sort of want it, but it's bad. And so you get your total take of HDL, non-HDL. That turns out to be probably a better predictor than LDL cholesterol. But they've stuck with LDL, and in the UK we've gone for the use of non-HDL for predicting risk. Now onto glucose lowering. And before we get into that, this has really been the most difficult thing. This study, published um, about 10 years ago, really changed things. Prior to this, there'd been small studies with conflicting data about men and women, fasting glucose versus HbA1c, morbidity versus mortality, strokes versus... But this study, which was big, 
really was able to rank HbA1c by these are half a percent of HbA1c, each one of these increments, half a percent across here, and there were known diabetics at the bottom. And looking at the impact, starting here as your referent categories for coronaries, cardiovascular events, and deaths, and you see as you got 0.5% of HbA1c, big benefits on coronaries and on cardiovascular events and on death. Every single one of those increments for half a percent of HbA1c, except that one and that one, these are the only non-significant pair, everything else was significant. So you would expect that if you lowered HbA1c by half a percent, then you're going to get some pretty good reductions in these vascular events. That's sort of the background to it. We don't have time to go through all the epidemiology, but I'll show you one more. This is with fasting plasma glucose and coronary events. And here you see, certainly down to four and a bit, you see this dose response effect on risk. So to reaffirm that, it looks as though by lowering the glucose, you should save vascular events. And indeed, if we look at the association, the criteria that make you think an association like the ones we've just seen, whether that is causative or not, these are the criteria that I think sort of extended Bradford Hill that uh, you might expect. Well, without showing you the data, just about all these are pretty much covered by glucose and cardiovascular events. There's a strong dose-response relationship. I just showed you that. The time sequence is right. Those levels antedated vascular events. It was independent of any other risk factors we knew about. It was pretty consistent in all the studies, as long as they're of a reasonable side. There was a plausible mechanistic mechanism, and you can predict, if you're diabetic, and from your glucose, how much likely you are to get cardiovascular events. The only question was about this reversibility, about lowering the glucose. What happened then? Well, the question was, up until recently, it's been very disappointing. Disappointing is generous, really. It's been worrying. Lowering the glucose was sometimes bad for you, and I'll show you some of that evidence. But the question was, how low should we lower glucose? And the advanced trial, this was a trial where they used a glycoside-based so sulfonylurea to lower um, glucose against placebo and it reduced the combined primary outcome, this intensive glucose lowering, uh, primary outcome of micro and macrovascular events, and, but this 10% was all about the microvascular benefits. This was driven by that, 14% microvascular benefits. And that was driven by nephropathy benefits, none on retinopathy, as you probably realize, diabetes gets you in all sorts of places, and apart from your kidneys, your eyes. But by lowering the glucose, there were no eye benefits. It was all about the kidneys. So that begat that, which begat that. But there were no significant effects on macrovascular events. It didn't reduce the big macrovascular events. And it should have done. It just didn't seem right. Why didn't it? Now, importantly, there were no significant adverse effect on all cause or cardiovascular mortality and that's important it didn't affect it badly didn't improve it but it didn't make it worse and the benefits were seen in every type of diabetic now that's pretty typical of the story we'd seen the glucose lowering gave microvascular benefits but it didn't give macrovascular benefits but I've highlighted the one on all-cause mortality because the big American study, not as big as ADVANCE, which was not American, had a primary outcome, the usual thing of non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke and cardiovascular death. And it was doing quite well. There was about a 10% benefit. This is the standard therapy. This is intensive. And after a few years, the intensive was looking good. It was starting to improve. It wasn't significant yet, but going in the right direction. But... All-cause mortality, shown on the right-hand side, there's intensive therapy, caused increased death, 22%, just statistically significant, so they stopped the trial. Doesn't matter that was going in the right direction, all-cause mortality was going in the wrong direction, they stopped the trial. Now, just to reiterate what I said, mortality was not increased in the other trials, ADVANCE and VADT, but Accord took this decision. 
flying in the face of what was shown in advance. And there's a big argument about why that might have happened. The people who ran this study said it wasn't about hypoglycemia. And I think that seems unlikely. I, I just don't think that's right. They're saying it wasn't the drugs they used. Nothing to do with insulin. Nothing to do with the thiazolidine dions, both of which have got clear adverse effects associated with them. But they said it was not that. Well, whatever it was about, they came to this conclusion. It had to be stopped. And so, the latest outcome trials investigating the effect of intensive versus standard glucose on total curve have not provided a clear answer. The American Diabetes Association has recently updated the target from under 6.5 to under 7. Now, in 30-odd years of messing around with cardiovascular disease, this doesn't happen much where the targets go up. We've got more and more assertive in everything, and this has gone up, and I suspect that's wrong. I don't think that. See, in the advanced trial, they got to the same level as they got in this, 6.4%, which is the mean reached in accord and in advance. In advance, no problems. And yet they're saying they're going to take it from under 65 to under 7. I think that's probably an error. And it really isn't about how low you go. It's what they use to get there. And I believe that this was down to the insulin and thiazolidine dion. Most of them were on insulin. Most, a high percentage were on uh, rosiglitazone. So I think that was a mistake. And I think that will be changed as the years go by. And the drugs get better as they have just done. So that raises the question, if I'm saying it's what you use, what should we be using? And... We could start with muraglitazar. That was a drug with alpha-gamma effects, if you're into PPAR alpha-gammas. And it increased, increased vascular events. So that got withdrawn. And then the one that really got the most fame was this analysis of rosy glitazone. Very, very popular drug. And used in shed loads in the ACCORD trial. Rosy glitazone was associated with a significant increase in the risk of myocardial infarction, with an increase in the risk of death, from cardiovascular causes of borderline significance. So against placebo, it was increasing MI and cardiovascular death. But it lowered the blood, blood sugar really well. And up until this point, that's all that mattered in diabetes. If the glucose was lowered by the drug in 15 mice, wallop, it was given to humans. That's how it worked. If it worked to lower the glucose, you could use it for diabetes. But, cognizant of that, rosiglitazone and some other examples we haven't got time to go into, he got this. The FDA and the EME gave guidance on how you can produce a new drug for diabetes. We've got this example of common therapy, that's rosiglitazone, increasing cardiovascular disease. So it really solidified, solidified these concerns that you need to assess cardiovascular safety. It won't do to lower the glucose. So they gave documents of what you've got to do. And this is the one from the FDA, which I'll explain to you, because I think this is pretty bizarre, but this is what's driven current practice. And this is going to be a forest plot. There's the hazard ratio of one, okay? And so things in that direction are good, things in that direction are bad, the hazard ratios. And what they said was, get your data with your new drug, whatever you've got, compared with placebo or compared with active or compared with whatever you've got data for, and bring it to us and present it to us. And if it's like that, that's the hazard ratio, that's the point estimate. And the confidence intervals there you see, not touching one, so that's statistically superior to whatever else they've compared with. If you come to me like that, your drug will be approved by the FDA. Similarly, if your result is like this, the same as your comparator, even if it's placebo. So long as the upper limit of the 95% is less than 1.3. Why 1.3? Nice round number. We'll have 1.3. So, so long as the 95% upper limit of the effect of your drug, it only damages you by 29%, that's okay. We'll approve it. So that was that bit. Now the alternatives are here. If it comes there where your 
data cross 1.3 and slightly in the wrong direction, even if it's in the right direction, if that 95% confidence limit is above 1.3, you need a big trial on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And these two <coughs> are losers. One point, if your upper limit is above 1.8, forget it. We're not going to approve it. So that is where most of these drugs are because they've not enough data to get the upper confidence limit under 1.3. So that has begun a whole lot of trials. But the implications, you see, the whole thing's changed now. Instead of saying we want drugs that reduce cardiovascular events, it's about safety. It's about showing that it is very likely that you're not going to do a maximum of 29% worsening of your risk. It isn't about getting things over here. It's being safe and therefore approvable. And that has resulted in this. DDP4Is, GLP1s, SGLT2s, insulin, PPAR, alpha-gamma drugs. Whoops. And that's the forest of trials that are going on in diabetes now. This is incredible. This is, you know, they didn't have any trials until about 15 years ago. None. There was UK PDS. That was it. And all of a sudden, there's a plethora of these trials which are evaluating and lots of exciting results coming through from these. So that's what these trials, in order to get their drugs on the market, they have to do these big cardiovascular morbidity mortality trials. About 160,000 patients going into these trials. So it's great. It's really very good indeed. But more of the same story that we heard before. Either the glucose lowering was bad for vascular events or there was no benefit. Alicardio trial with aliglitazole, that's a PPAR alpha gamma mix. Accord, this was the one I showed you, more versus less intensive. Origin was adding insulin versus usual care, no benefit. Examine, these were the new, these are the incretins, alogliptin. The DDP4Is, DDP4 inhibitors, examine, didn't work. Saxagliptin, didn't work. Citagliptin, didn't work. Lixisenatide, these are the GLP1s, first of those didn't work. So they said, well, what's going off? Why did that happen? And you sit down and think, well, you've got the epidemiology we started with, which showed a significant link, and it looked as though it was causal. Why would this, uh, these trials conflict with the epidemiology-based expectations? Well, the first thing might be that the epidemiological association we looked at, and I showed you a couple of sides, wasn't causal. Well, because I think of all the evidence that's out there, I think it probably is causal. I think raised glucose does causally increase your risk. Maybe the trial results were negative because there were lack of power or chance. I don't think so. The results were consistently zip, nothing. It wasn't, you know, 7 or 8% in the right direction. It was nothing. It just didn't seem to make sense. Maybe treating an etiological factor doesn't necessarily guarantee the reversibility of the effect. That seems reasonable. 60 years of atheroma you've been working at with your fags and your blood pressure and everything else. And then for five years you try and lower the glucose a bit and you expect to get rid of it all. Well, that's probably unreasonable and that's reflected here. Maybe the intervention was too short or too small or too late. So the population studies were wrong. So these kind of feed into... This one, I think that may be right. And then there's the other one the diabetologists really don't like, that the interventions might cause other off-target damage. So they lowered the glucose, but they increased X or Y, and I think part of that may have been at play. So I was busy sitting here tearing my hair out. You won't believe it, before these, I had hair. And then I was sitting there, well, what is this about? What is, what, why is this happening? And then this got published in the press, press release. Before it was published, the 20th of August, this is the thing now, they published, got to go to the stock market. They, it's illegal, they claim, not to tell the stock market, their shareholders, before the paper's published. But that was, and this was Empagai flows in. This is the SGLT2 inhibitors. They work. These are the drugs that make you pee out the glucose. Basically, you just pee out glucose. And they work. That's what that said. It worked. And here are the results. Primary endpoint, non-fatal MI, it was statistically significantly. It was set up for um, equivalence initially, and if that 
was equivalent, they then went for superiority, and it was for the primary endpoint. Death, cardiovascular disease, 38% reduction. Death from any cause, 32% reduction. Hospitalization for heart failure, I didn't have time to show you, but some of those gliptin trials, saxagliptin and allagliptin, had shown an increase in heart failure. So not only did there no benefits, they'd increased heart failure, which is very common in diabetes. So everyone was running around really suicidal about, you know, what is the meaning of life? But then this came along, and you've got this big 35% reduction in heart failure. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And then just when you're getting over the excitement of why embaglyphlosin might work, this got announced, and this is liraglutide. I said lixizenotide hadn't worked. That didn't work. That's short-acting. Liraglutide is a longer-acting GLP-1 um, agonist. GLP-1 agonist is the group. And this worked. And this is going to be presented at the American Diabetes Association in a month or so. So very exciting, but a significant benefit on cardiovascular events. So now two drugs, two types of drugs have come up with benefit and nobody knows why or how that's worked. So that's the excitement for the moment. There are more trials coming through. There's exenatide is probably going to get published at the end of this year or announced. That's it's heading in that direction. So I think for the first time we really do have some drugs that are going to work from a glucose lowering. But to conclude, I apologize I didn't really emphasize this. Diet and lifestyle are the critical determinants of type 2 diabetes and merit routine intervention. It should be absolutely core. Those who've got type 2 diabetes should be treated with a statin. It doesn't matter what their lipid levels are. If you've got type 2 diabetes already, you should have blood pressure lowering. And probably, probably the advanced trial suggests it didn't matter what your blood pressure level was, lower it. As far as glucose lowering is concerned, you will get microvascular benefits if you lower the glucose. But long-term macrovascular benefits, well, that seems to depend on what you use. And what we know so far is the SGLT2, one of them, empagliflozin, and liraglutide. Oh, and I should have told you four or five days ago, uh, semaglutide has also announced to the stock market that that too has produced significant benefits. So we've got a third drug. Semaglutide, liraglutide, and SGLT2 work on top of usual care. So we wait to see whether the guidelines are going to recommend that. What about aspirin? Well, I use it for the highest risk patients. Anyone with established vascular disease and also the highest risk patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, I use it there. But that is, I think, a quick look at what I think we should be doing. But meanwhile, I think what we have to acknowledge is there's a huge and increasing medical, social and economic burden associated with diabetes. And that's worse in the developing countries than anywhere else in the world. What we need urgently is region-specific targeted preventive strategies to prevent people getting diabetes. Why? Because we can't afford to pay for diabetes. In UK, the NHS spends about 1.1 million pounds per hour treating diabetes and its complications. 1.1 million pounds per hour. Now, if you extrapolate that to India, where it's four times as common and um, 20 times the size population, that works out at um, 100 million pounds per hour. In India they cannot afford that you cannot let diabetes happen it's got to be prevented so we really need this urgently that seems to me to be the most important thing in cardiovascular medicine for the moment we're sort of getting there with lipids and blood pressure this is what has to happen because the size of growth of type 2 diabetes is terrifying absolutely terrifying but for those who've already got it what you must do is lower the blood pressure and the lipids. That's mandatory. Don't think. You don't have to think. Just treat. Lower it. Uh, and then for mac macrovascular protection. And then SGLT2s plus liraglutide plus semaglutide on top of usual care. We wait and see if that gets into the guidelines. Thank you for your attention.
Um, are you happy to take I'd questions? I'd love to, yeah. Um, any questions or comments? Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, you. You didn't give metformin any credit for possible effects of macrovascular disease. No, I'm sorry. But in the interest of time, I, sure. I, I had hidden UK PDS. For, for the audience who, who perhaps don't know, within UK PDS, metformin was given to what was called the overweight diabetes. It was a small subgroup, I think 346 of them. And that was um, close to statistical, or it, it, it was in that subgroup statistically significant in terms of benefits of MIs. Uh, more importantly, in the, of the trial overall, MI reduction, the PVAR is 0.052. Intensive glucose frame is 0.052. So they said no significant benefit on MI. Bit harsh. True, but harsh. Statistically, it wasn't strictly true. And then when they follow those people up for a further 10 years post trial, then that same size effect associated with intensive glucose lowering did become statistically significant. And the metformin group, the small metformin group, continued to be statistically significant. But I think it's, I do think on the basis of that, it's been the only evidence that we had in diabetology to, um, to guide practice to try and prevent cardiovascular events. Personally, I would have used pioglitazone. I still would in preference to metformin because I think it's a better drug and I think it's more effective and I think lots of other things. That's been hit with the halo effect from rosy glitazone and I think they're actually quite different. Um, but your point is well made. Metformin is in every world guideline as a first line therapy based on 300 and odd patients. That's terrifying. No other area of medicine on the basis of 350 or would have it in every world guideline as your starting drug. If you look at left main disease and how we manage it invasively, again, if you look at the evidence base, the numbers are frighteningly small. Yeah. Fascinating thing. It, it is an extraordinary thing. I mean, if you go to the lipid-lowering trials, if the drug doesn't save cardiovascular events, throw it away. In diabetes, they're doing all these trials. So long as it doesn't damage you, you can have it. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It's a completely different mindset. Imagine coming out with a new blood pressure-lowering drug and say, look, it lowers the blood pressure doesn't do anything for cardiovascular events, but it doesn't increase them. Oh, fantastic, we'll use it. No one would even dream about it. But in diabetes, it's get, they, you know, they have been used. Now the SGLT2, these now three positive trial results, I think hopefully that will change things. But you're right, in different areas of medicine, we've got dodgy ground, but diabetes is too important to be pootling around with a study on 354 people. As, as the mainstay of therapy. I don't think it should be. And someone's got to have the balls to do the trial, metformin versus SGLT2 versus... The liraglutide is an injection once a day. Semaglutide is an injection once a week. So in the context of diabetes, certainly once a week, nobody cares. That's not a big deal, because a lot of them are doing that anyway. But the oral one, the SGLT2s, seem to me to have a head start. But it's a one-off chance, sorry. Um, brilliant. Nobody knows. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to persuade Boringer Ingelheim to do some of the relevant studies. Nobody knows. Boringer Ingelheim don't have a clue. You've got a four millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure. There was a couple of kilos reduction in body weight. And the HbA1c was down by about 0.4%. But was that enough to prevent the heart failure, the big heart failure, Bennett, didn't look right, does it? And I know uh, John McMurray, for example, thinks this is just a diuretic effect. It might be, but the work needs to be done. They don't even know BNP. They don't have any feel for this. So these studies are all being, everyone's queuing up to do the basic mechanistic studies to try and find out what, what does cause it. Ivan. His issue with metformin, that the drug is out of Patent and that no one's interested in doing the sort of large scale 
I think it's a bit like trying to take on statins. I think people, I mean, except statins have got real evidence. Metformin's got a bit, but everyone says, what do you mean? Metformin, we've got, you've got to use metformin. That is the, and most diabetologists believe that that is the right thing to use. So no, I don't think it's about money because the other, the other competitors, they'll put up the money to take it on. It's the ethics. I think, it's a, you know, you, if you said, oh, I now want to do a trial against statins, you'd say, oh, no, no, no. It's on top of statins versus placebo, and that's the only way I think these trials are being set up. But I think the evidence is so powerful. For, for example, empagliflozin is so powerful, those benefits, that swamps anything that metformin could ever do. I think they should take it on as a head-to-head. And, and, and maybe trust me, you know these new, um, newer monotonic antibody type drugs for... <laughs> Lipid, yeah. Are people looking at those studies of trans and diabetes? Um, there is, in terms of the, the metabolic effect, there isn't. Uh, there's a subgroup in the Fourier trial. The Fourier trial will probably announce this year, that's the Amgen product, which is PCSK9. I can never remember their proper name, but it's the Amgen one. I think it's the Fourier trial. I think it'll probably get published this year. And there's a significant diabetic subgroup in there. You get, that's one of the ways of getting in. But there isn't a pure diabetes uh, I don't think. I don't think there's a pure diabetes trial. There was a diabetic group in Sprint? Yeah. Uh, well, no, he, he, he left out diabetes. For, yeah, the Sprint and post-stroke was left out. They, because of Accord, mm. they felt it wasn't mm. uh, legitimate. So there, there wasn't really, I think 2% had got diabetes, okay. but they left them out. Sprint was recently published, and this has really thrown the cat amongst the pigeons, because they have done uh, that 140 versus 120 bit in people, but not with diabetes and not post-stroke because it was felt unethical for different reasons. So they've done it and they've just reported, and again this was on the fuller version of the lecture, uh, they showed that less than 120 was better than less than 140 in terms of cardiovascular events. So given that about, and the more globally, 13% of people in the world get their blood pressures controlled. 13% of hypertensives get their blood pressures controlled to 140, 90. And then an American study comes up and said, yeah, well, you actually should be going for 120. It's just terrifying. But the ringer with Sprint is that in Sprint, they measured the blood pressure in a totally different way. The patients were in a room on their own with an automated machine, and they took it themselves, and it was the mean of three readings. Now, it turns out if you measure the blood pressure like that, it's 7, 8, 9, 10 millimeters lower than if there's a doctor or a nurse present. So any medic-ish who's in the room puts your blood pressure up, on average, by about 8 to 10 millimeters. So when Sprint said 120 is better than 140, the way we measure it, it probably means 130 is better than 150. So my guess, looking at the new data and there's been two or three other meta-analyses which conflict and argue not mention hope three is another problem um, I think 130 should probably be the target not 120 because we can't be certain about that but 130 should be getting 139 won't do it should be lower than that less than 135 to 130 that's the sort of band where we should probably be going that would be my best guess at the moment measured the way we measure it but it's, it's, not, it's not easy, that's going to... And, and if you think about most of the world, if you go to most places in the world and say, oh, we're now going to lower the targets to 130, they say, you are mad. We can't, you know, most of these places are not getting anywhere near 140. So it's, as a global recommendation, it makes no sense. It's got to be temp tempered to the um, resources available in the different parts of the world, and most of the world just can't afford it. So it'll be a hell of an improvement. If we get people be less than 140, it's a fantastic improvement worldwide. But the first thing is you've got to, you've got to measure it. So.